My home was happened out when I got beat up by my husband. He was going to bury me. I've had people just, you know, shoot me up with too much dope so they could rob me. And I don't know what to say. It's, uh, it's, it's hard out there. It's tragic because we should be able to house everybody in Canada. You know, we're, we're, we're a fairly rich country and we should be able to have housing for all our citizens. So part of it is just, you know, looking at all the plenty in our community and then seeing that there's people who are just without anything. You know, nobody in my 30 years down here, nobody down here chooses to be down here, you know, if they'd had a choice. But it's starting to become accepted, you know. And that really scares me, you know, because they're almost normalizing it. So people are, are starting to think that people do choose to be a sex trade worker. Well, you know, it's almost like they have a career day in school. And the most upsetting story is usually about people losing custody of their kids. Something happened, and things went wrong, and I lost custody of my kids. And all I want to do is get better so I can see my kids again. And the sadder I get about that, the more I screw my life up. And the more I screw my life up, the less attainable it is to ever see my kids again. You know, one girl says, well, no, I choose to do this. And I, I said, no, I said, you may choose to do it now because you're comfortable doing it. But I said, if you look me square in the eyes and tell me that, you know, if I was your dad and from the very day you came, you know, onto this earth, I gave you a hug every day and told you how much I loved you, you look me in the face and tell me that you'd be out here doing this. And, you know, I've never had one girl respond to that. You know, you know I've had a lot of girls, you know, eyes well up with tears. But the bottom line is, you know, nobody chooses to be a sex trade worker.
you know, over the years I've been down here, I've seen people, I've seen a stockbroker that was a very successful stockbroker, you know, one month, you know, and two months later he was down here robbing grocery stores with a, you know, a blood-filled syringe. You know, it can really happen to anybody. We've had people down here that have come from very influential families. You know, they have family members down here that are addicted. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's just not that simple. There's people from all walks of life. I think everyone has to understand, and I think more and more people do, that homelessness is not a downtown east side issue. It's not a other uh, community issue. It's about the whole region. It's about every neighborhood in Vancouver and across the lower mainland. And that until we all reframe the issue that way and come at it from a more compassionate, understanding perspective, then I think it's going to be very hard. Nobody wants to be homeless. None of the women come in and say, gee, I'm glad I don't have a place to go. I'm glad I don't have a home. It's not a freeing thing. It doesn't unburden them. And our dream in the shelter is that when women come in the door, that's the first step to ending homelessness. And we're going to support them from that point until they really are in a, st in a stable, permanent place. So there's a lot of demand for our services in the women's shelter. Um, between both of our shelters, St. Elizabeth, where we serve single women and families, and Powell Place, um, last year alone we served 800 individuals in those shelters and sadly had to turn away more than we serve. So there is a lot of, there is a lot of need for the, the safety and security and support of a women's shelter. You know, I ran into one lady actually this morning and, and, you know, and she looked healthy. I haven't seen her for a while. And she says, they're awesome there. She says, they help me do things. She says, I can't go to welfare and talk to the people there. I have difficulty with them, so they come with me. And that's something that I think a lot of people forget. I mean, even though we place these people in, in places, they don't have the skills you know, to go into the welfare offices or, or different offices and deal with the bureaucracy. From the beginning, they're starting to talk to you about what's the plan at the end of the 30 days. and. They're pretty flexible in terms of wanting to get uh, women a place so that if there's, they're working on it and they're in process and okay, well, they're going to have to wait another month, well, they can stay at Paul Place because if they, if they say, okay, well, we've got you a place for October, but between now and October, you know, you're on your own, probably by the time it gets to be October, this woman will be, you know, who knows where. The way we look at it, St. James, is that we're not running a shelter program. We're running a housing program for women and children and that for the vast majority of people who come through the front door of our shelters, we can get to the point where that's the end of their experience of homelessness. We're not there yet, but we are making huge strides and I look at the commitment of our staff and the commitment of the community around us and the commitment of the leaders in our community. And I know that with a little bit more effort, we can get to that goal and it will be uh, a tremendous day for our society and, and, and for the city.
God, I was lucky to find this place. I really was. You know, I can't say enough about it. For me, I don't. I don't know if it works that way for everyone, but it, it saved my life. It really did. You know. So here I am at St. James. And I love you guys very, very much, and I appreciate all the things you guys have done for me. I have come a long ways. I mean, I can't say enough about you guys because I think you just you did a hell of a job. I think you guys are just me. wonderful. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I really do. I hope you're hearing that from everybody else because that's the way I feel. Mm.